during the course of this term. Um, the uh, audio and video thing, yes. Yes, you record it with your phone or your recording device or your camcorder or your iPhone or whatever, your laptop, and then do whatever you have to do to get it into the right file format to then publish it up there. The first four people to post each kind, uh, like you post an audio and then three more people post an audio, the first four will get paid Kurtz dollars for it. And the people that post videos, same thing. Now, if you post an audio uh, and you post a video and you're one of the first four, we'll pay you for the video because you get twice as much for posting video. Um, but we won't count, you know, we'll, you're not gonna get paid for both and you're not gonna use out someone else being one of the four, unless there's, there's less than four who posted in the other category. So if you got either category that has four or less and, you're, and you posted in each one, you'll get paid for the audio posting and the video posting. The reason for that is that we're trying to get four out there Stuff goes wrong with people's recordings. Machines get forgotten, or somebody drops it, or sneezes, or you can't make out of it. Well, when you have it from all over the room, especially with video, it's a whole different deal. Somebody's video misses this because I walked out of their frame, and someone else a little bit from this angle, and it's better. So that's actually additional information. After about four, we don't really have time to check all that. We don't have time to actually go through and, and uh, proctor 10 or 11 videos and audios for each class period. It's time consuming as it is to make sure that it's not like a duplicate. Do not make a copy of a file to rename it. I mean, if it's exactly the same, if it's exactly the same file, then that's academic dishonesty. And that you'll, you won't pass the course. If there's any, any even slight academic dishonesty will not pass the course. Um, that I won't, I won't give a grade to anybody who's even been, if you even fudge when you tell me why you weren't here or you were late or whatever, if you even, this the hint of deception, you will fail the course, okay? Um, I'm gonna do the best I can to be merciful rather than heinous, um, but the one thing that breaks our contract so we can't do business anymore is if, I'm dishonest with you or you're dishonest with me. So there's, there's, it's hard to have a communication contract between human beings if, if it's just sort of, you know, the way honesty is usually treated, the way it's treated so often in business and in government and even in church. We just, I, in my sphere, I just can't do that. Um, what, when I was in law enforcement, I noticed they went to great lengths to try to get people who, um, including like an eight hours, uh, an, an eight hour psychological battery with an, all kinds of interviews with multiple industrial psychologists and like six or seven different tests and everything, trying to get people who are the right kind of uh, broken so that they are more honest than kind. And as a result, you get a group of people you're working with that their whole life is about giving you the straight scoop, even if it's too much information, every day. If you ask, hey, how are you doing? Doesn't matter whether it's me asking a female deputy, they give you their whole rundown on their, how their body life is going and everything, and it's like, ooh, shouldn't have asked. Everybody just, but everything's out there. It's people that will go to court and swear that they screwed up. So, as a result, in comparing notes in the locker room and comparing notes in, in the lineup, people come home to regular, actual sane, normal people that aren't cop types, and they are asking, hey, how was your day, you know, and the person starts narrating their day a little bit, and then you see the same kind of perception patterns that you see in the bad guys that you were dealing with all day, and you're going, 
So I don't even have a real relationship with them, you know? So, I mean, it really makes it hard for folks that are sort of broken in that way. Well, I can't get unbroken, and when people lie, uh, it, you know, it just shuts me down completely. So just, even if you look heinous, or I look heinous, or we both look heinous, just tell, tell me the truth or don't tell me anything at all, okay? Um, don't copy each other's quizzes or tests. Don't turn in the same silly cut and paste Wikipedia stuff when you turn in your paper. That we get that every time. TAs say, look at this, it's the same bad essay, like word for word, you know? So, oh, they put paragraph one down here in paragraph three and switch it and turn it in. Just, let's just play honest while we're here. Um, As far as the, um, as far as posting the lectures, you can use those to study. You can, you can use those to hold me accountable. If you find that I said one thing one time and then I contradicted the next time, it won't be on purpose that I contradicted it because my memory went south. Then I'll pay you. When you catch me making a mistake, if I give some philosopher and some historic figure's name and it's the wrong name or I give a century and you go, no, that's nonsense, and you whip you, and it's like, you know, you're 200 years off. That, you know, just call me out right here and I'll pay you, because I, I want that, I want to buy that kind of editing. If you find mistakes in this, if you find mistakes on a quiz, um, if you find mistakes on a test, I'll always pay you as you. If you find mistakes on a quiz and I pay you, um, I'll probably leave the mistake on the quiz unless it's just unless it's something that is confusing people, but like it's misspelling or something. I'll probably leave it there to give you another chance to look for it when that same question is cut and pasted onto the midterm and onto the final. Um, everything that you see on a quiz in this class will be on the midterm if the quiz occurred before the midterm. There's no, I wonder which things. You'll receive your quizzes back, they're yours to keep, and then I promise you that that will be on the midterm. And if it's on the midterm, then I promise you it's gonna be on the final. Everything, 100% of the midterm will be cut and pasted onto the final, and you'll have your midterm in your hand to study for the, for the final, okay? And the final, not only will have that, but it'll have everything on it that would, every single question that was on every single quiz between the midterm and the final. So it's all cumulative, okay? That's not all, though, that will be on the tests. And the quiz is not just over the reading. Quizzes and the midterm and the final are all 100% cumulative. Everything we say together here, everything that we show on the films, and everything that gets written up on the board that you know we're emphasizing, and any documents or announcements or anything like that that I post on the course website in, in the uh, announcements part. Uh, and, and I may put documents up there, say please read this, or here's a link, please, you know, this essay I want you to read. That, that would mean it's quizzable by the next time you come to class, and on every quiz, you can have something clear from the first part of the the class. Six weeks from now, we can give you on the quiz something that was said last Tuesday, you know, two days ago. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. Um, let's see. If you if you miss class and you don't have an uh, you don't have uh, an excuse that's uh, accepted for still getting credit for being here, then it will lower your grade, a portion of a grade, your final grade in the course. After everything else is figured, all the points and all of that, I will look at the attendance record, and if you were gonna get an A, but you have one unexcused absence, that would mean that it was an A minus. And if you were gonna have a B, that means it will be a B minus. If you have Three unexcused absences. That's a that's a letter grade. All right. Um, tardies. 
better like you come halfway through the class. I don't, you know, if you're five minutes late, I'll still be screwing around here at the desk and talking to people and stuff. Um, you're not a computer program, and I'm not trying to be, you know, one minute precise. Oh, got you. It's not like that. But we've come in here and you've missed a substantial amount of the class period, then, then that's going to be a portion of a letter grade that'll be, you know, then you're tardy again, then pretty soon that's a, a, port, that's a fraction of a grade as if it was an absence. Okay? Um, the term paper, um, we're not going to give you the specifics of exactly what to do. Um, we'll be negotiating and talking about it as we go along, but it'll be toward the end that I'll tell you about the term paper. Some people are the get it done, check it off the list kind of folk, and they love to be able to boom, 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 three weeks into the term, I've got all the assignments done. But that, that won't make it because I'm assuming that very few people have the, the tools that I'd like to see you use on that assignment until toward the end of the course. Um, so we may even clarify the definition of the assignment as we go along <coughs> as well. Um, somebody may have an idea and go, hey, could I do this kind of thing for it? And we'll talk about that and say, yeah, and then I'll make that writing option available to everybody. So in essence, though, in essence, whatever you do, it will involve some variant of writing your own philosophy, okay? Um, when you say your own philosophy, I mean philosophy the way we're doing philosophy in here, not like um, I heard one philosophy professor say that he heard two students walking through the, the quad at their university and um, one of the uh, students said to the other, what's your philosophy on education? And the second student said, I'm for it. And the person said, that's a good philosophy. And they changed the subject and kept going. By what's your philosophy, I don't mean you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you believe in God, and here's the text to prove it. I'm glad if you are. I would hope you would be. I would love to see everybody be a Seventh-day Adventist and noted text to show why they believe in God and all of that. That's just not our topic. It isn't philosophy. If you turn that in in biology class, you would get an F. And if you turn that in in here, you'll get an F. You can mention that theology and your beliefs about God are part of your philosophy, and that's a valid part of your philosophy. But simply telling me your religious beliefs is not synonymous with philosophy is something else, something that I'm in favor of. But you can't turn that in in algebra, you can't turn that in in biology, you can't turn that in in history class, and you can't turn that in here and get, and get credit. I've been teaching this since, I think, uh, 2006 or five, 2005, I think. And so far, I've never had a class where I don't have actually quite a good number of people that that's what their whole paper is. No matter what I say, somebody still turns that in like they're standing up for their faith or something. Which, again, which I'm in favor of, but just not when we're doing something else. Okay? Um, the stuff that I'm handing out, these, uh, these Kurtz dollars, um, when you receive one, take this out, his hand comes out. He hasn't done anything with his hand comes out. There's something I admire about that. These things, when you receive them, um, write your name in the top left part where it says your name. That's the hint I put there so you know where to put it. And then right below that, down toward the bottom of that, this is PUC student ID number. That's where you write your, can you guess? PUC student ID number. You were the first person out of all 60-some-odd people. That's amazing. And then, the 
the date goes where it says, who's you? <laughs> Jinx things. It was just like I couldn't split a second any more than that. Um, it was just so close it was synonymous. And you write out what you do to earn it. So he would say, I said why you earned it, you know, or why you got it. And I was arguably first. Okay, and you would put something similar to that. So in order to have the Kurt Stoller be valid when you turn it in, then it's, it's important that we be able to look at it and say, oh yeah, that's right. Um, there's all kinds of reasons you'll learn those things. Um, if you get a bunch of them all at once, it's a bit of a challenge, but you're still ahead of the game. Why are you getting these things? Can you turn them in like for a new car or something? I think you'll get arrested if you make somebody think that there is something you can buy a car with. But I don't know, maybe one of you has a car for sale and you're worried about passing the class and your whole degree rests on it. And you say, dude, you can totally have my Porsche if you just give me your 149 Kurtz dollars because I have negative four Kurtz dollars. And here it is the end. And I'm right on the edge of passing this thing. And it's a cognate for my religion major. And so I'll give you my Porsche if you give me your Kurtz dollars. That's on you, I don't care, it's fine. If you want to bargain and everything, beautiful. You said uh, four neg negative four, can you have negative first dollars? If I find you, oh. if I levy How a fine. You get I don't know, I've never done it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems cool to save the option just in case, you know, I, I miss writing tickets. <laughs> Yeah, you can. You'll need to note that you did. No. No, that would that would kind of mess up the economy. <laughs> then you'll then you'll write on it somewhere else what you did. You'll just say, hey, I got this from so and so. You forgot to pay these. I did? Did I pay you? I guess I'm in the negative. I forgot to find her. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yes. How many Kurtz dollars do you need in order to get a uh, full participation? More than zero. And way more than that. Here's how that gets figured. Here's how that gets figured. Oh, you want to know how it's figured, right? Go ahead. Can you use them on Can you use them on Can you, like, buy things from me, like bribe me to give you a better grade? Yes. Oh. Um, when we have auctions, some it just depends on the mood I'm in. I'm just, you know, sometimes I'm in a generous mood and someone says, hey, can I buy a, you know, during an auction, when I've declared an auction, can I please buy a quiz point on quiz three? I totally blew quiz three. And, and they go, well, what would you start bidding for? And you would say, oh, one cursor. And someone else says, I'll give you 103. And you say, I'm out. And then we, and then it goes until people say, and then you, Maybe try again later, but we'll have auctions like that. Okay. I think I'll figure this out. So what's the cap on the first dollar that we keep? There is no cap. Uh, we will keep printing them as long as you keep earning them. So far, we print, what did we print, 1,200 so far? I think we did it again. I think to this point, we've printed 1,200. But we'll print more, and we keep track of how much we print, and then at the end, whatever you've ended up with and you turn in, I will, I will curve that. Okay, that's gonna, the course isn't curved, but the participation credit part is curved. If you have three Kurtz dollars and that's, and, and, and the next runner up has 61 Kurtz dollars, you're, you're not getting participation, you know, you're not getting full participation credit whatsoever, okay? So your job is to participate. If you are zero, and you know, I end up every single class, every single term, I end up with five or six people with zeros. That means I haven't said anything. Now, you don't have to be 
eloquent up front, you can be afraid to death, then record the class and post up. You know, you've got every day, you've got a chance to, to do that. Um, you'll notice that participation yields 10%. 10% of your grade. That means if you got 100% on everything, but you got zero participation credit, you'd have 90% in the class. And that would be a B plus. All the way down from a straight A to a B plus because you didn't participate. We do participation things in here. Um, wait. Do you turn in your curtain dollars or whatever at the end of the quarter? At the end of the quarter, actually at the final. When you turn your final in, because I keep giving you Kurtz dollars if you keep finding my stupid mistakes on the final. And if you turn in Kurtz dollars at an auction, then they do double duty. Whatever you bought, you get. And then you turn it in to the cashier, which coincidentally is the TA. And the TA gives you credit for participation as well as gives you what you have coming that you bought at auction. I have no idea. When I run out of things to say someday, I say, oh, that's all I had. We better do an auction. I gotta fill some time. Fair enough. It's really arbitrary. Um, so you said the first four people to upload a video or audio. Does that mean like every class period? Or every class period. Oh, okay. Every class period. What's the highest number of Kurtz dollars you've given, you've given out? Like, if you want to beat the record, like, what are you going for? Um, like, what's the most any of my classes that a top student has ever turned, ever gotten? Um, so far, I don't think I've ever seen anyone actually go much beyond 200. There's one guy who everyone was like, actually had a contract out on him who was just filibustering every class period. I'm like, I had carpal tunnel from paying the guy. <laughs> People were actually threatening to hurry him. And he was almost at 200. Are we going to start talking about something more closely? Are you making philosophy soon? Or more no. <laughs> because this <laughs> yes, I do. not any closer than this, but some things that you're going to think are more traditional content mm -hmm. on first hearing without having to get perspective on it, <coughs> if that helps. Does that answer? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. What else? What else can you get? Yes, sometimes people do. Depends on my mood. It's kind of like a tyrant. You know, you, real money? Yeah, we always have some money. <laughs> the reason for the real money is that I like to check in and see how much, you know, what the currency exchange is and how much you're valuing it as you go. It's always fascinating. No, if you lose it, bummer. I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's up to me. And, and you say, oh, I'd like to fit in this or I say, oh, no, but I'd be more. But the one thing I know more than ever is that's like stupid for like Yeah, in fact, I had the copy center, get this, I had the copy center contact me and say, hey, there's a dude that we can uh, identify that came in here and asked us to make copies of sheets of these things that we thought that wasn't what you wanted. Since we've never seen him before, and we, I always tell them who my TA is, they didn't make the copies and that was a bad day. Yes. <laughs> If it's not on topic, it's just nonsense. Yeah, know? like if it's just obviously only for the Right. I mean like they're sitting there and I'm talking about I'm talking about Aristotle and someone says, Oh, uh, what is the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> and they say, That's a world religions question. That's not a philosophy one on one question. <clears throat> Okay. And that's cool. that. Okay. I'm not sure if you answered this, but um, what do you mean when you say what's your philosophy? Excellent question. 
<laughs> See, we're almost out of fuel, and we look, and, and there's a landing strip. Excellent. Um, do you know it's a lot easier to say what we don't need? No. It's a lot easier to say, well, that's not philosophy. Well, I don't mean by that, I just say, hey, guess, and then when you're wrong, I just say, no, no credit. Not, it's, it's not like that. Um, the problem is that we're actually going to spend the whole term talking about the impossible task of defining philosophy. This is an intro course. And if it was a whole PhD program for you, you would finish and you'd still have to say, that's not a straightforward question. What is philosophy? <coughs> Um, one of the Supreme Court justices a number of years ago, one of the U.S. Supreme Court justices, was, um, was wrestling with uh, a case in which they were trying to consider whether or not to consider an appeal for a uh, pornography uh, conviction out of one of the states. And so the person arguing the case, or arguing that it should be considered, uh, said, Justice so-and-so, can you give me a definition of pornography? And he wrestled with that, and the other justices wrestled with that, and he finally said, no, but I know it when I see it. You know, how would you define it? I could show you something you go, yeah, that's nasty, that's porn. <laughs> but I say, okay, define porn. You give me a definition, I say, oh, well, does that mean such and such is porn? You say, well, no, not that. Well, but that fits your definition, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but not that. No matter what you say, that's what you end up doing, even with, even with philosophy. Some of the misuses of the word philosophy like those two students talking about their philosophy of, it doesn't just mean, um, yeah, but I was going to say something, I thought about it, and I said, well, yeah, kind of it does. I was going to say, it doesn't just mean what you like instead of what you don't like. Actually, that, that's axiology, and <laughs> it would be hard to deny that that's a philosophy. But there's a way you could say that so that it would be clearly, I'd say, nah, that's not a philosophy. You see why we need a whole class in it? It's that tough. And that's what we're going to be trying to do, is, is make it so that as this course progresses, you'll be able, when somebody says, well, what is philosophy? You can say, it depends on what you're really looking for when you ask that question. Um, some people have conceived of philosophy as, and then you can say, and then other people have conceived of philosophy as. During this era, people define philosophy as this. During this era, people define philosophy as th this other thing. Philosophy functions in this way, but it doesn't function in this way, although it used to function in that way. Does, does that make sense? Remember, last class period, I said philosophy is the discipline that deals with intractable uh, intellectual pursuits, things that are intractable are, are, are the purview of philosophy. When they become tractable, as did what used to be called natural philosophy, it came out of the birth canal, became its own baby, and we named it physics. But that used to be philosophy. Same thing with astronomy. Same thing with chemistry. Same thing with psychology. And right now, it would depend on which university chair of philosophy you asked whether logic is considered a branch of philosophy or is it its own discipline. There's a handful of universities that have a philosophy department or a college of philosophy, and then they have a completely different department for logic. Economics was recently 
purely philosophy. Now, it's inarguably not philosophy. Although, every discipline, when you get to the frontier, when you get to the point where people have to say, well, we don't know, we're arguing about it, and we're, we, we have theories, but we don't know. When you take another step, that is returning home to philosophy. It has been said that philosophy is the, the mother discipline that gives birth to the other disciplines, and they all are forced from time to time to come home to do their laundry. Like you do, you know, when you have a break. You know you take almost the whole quarter's laundry right to your mom. That happens. Today, though, people in the sciences like to say, oh, well, we don't do philosoph philosophies. You know, they think that's yesterday. And so then they start philosophizing and calling it science. And it most definitely is not science. When they're doing philosophy, simply wearing a lab coat and using the facts that they got actually doing science. That's not science. It's not about not understanding it. You can, you can understand the problem. Like I said, a completely smooth glass wall and a climber that needs to find, there's, you know, you just can claw at it. You got no, you got no ideas. And as soon as you develop some tools, as soon as you think of a way to approach it and then it becomes something that you start, you start doing methodically, you have equipment and you have protocols, there's something you can do to gain information. As soon as you start doing that and it becomes manageable, approachable at all, then it's a candidate for leaving, you know, growing up and establishing its own household. Yes, ma'am? Um, you said it's a lot easier to say what we don't mean. Um, so when approaching questions um, like what is philosophy and like these then, or like, and you know, that don't have concrete answers. Um, would you say it would be better to approach them trying to figure out what we don't mean, or? Both. It would be good to, every time you're trying to define something, there's ways that you go about it. Because actually giving the definition of something is really harder than we think. You realize that if you take a dictionary, the kind that comes in a book, <coughs> remember those books? Yeah. <laughs> like with paper and stuff, writing. There's no words in the dictionaries, in a dictionary, that without the dictionary you could define. So it's, it's one, it, it always, serves, every single word, even a and the and 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 is, they have their own entry. <laughs> That's a bootstrap thing. It's like pull, trying to lift yourself to the ceiling by pulling up on your own shoelaces. Who says? Who gets to say? Y you know, you're defining everything in there by other things in there. Wh wh how does that start? Like you say your personal philosophy gets changed over time? Has my personal philosophy? Oh, yes. Constantly is changing. It'll change by the end of this class. I'll probably correct things. And I hope that the biggest factor in, in making me make huge changes in my philosophy will be you all. It almost always ends up that way. People ask something and they go, oh shoot, that means I've been teaching crap all quarter. And, and I have to say, you know what, I rethought that. I, and, and now my house is falling down because some part of the foundation just got taken out and it's, and it's doing this, you know? I hope that happens. It's, it's delightful when that happens. I refer to myself not as a philosopher. I refer to myself as a curiosity. Does that make sense? Um, soon, I've been saying this for three or four years, so maybe it'll happen one day when I finish my PhD. But I bought curiosopher.com, .net, .org, and all that, and I own those. And I'm going to put something up there one of these days. Could you tell us what your personal philosophy is at the moment? What is my personal philosophy? Uh, yes. I can tell you what it is at the moment, and I will do that for 10 weeks. 
I have, just as a way of sort of illustrating what you might think about I even mean when I say, hey, develop your own philosophy, just the, the page that's just before the pretest, which should be missing on your, on your syllabi, is 10 principles for making your life a masterpiece. That's a, that's a slice of my philosophy. And I found what is not all that elegant, but at least it gives me some outline so that I could go through each of these with a certain method. Um, 10 principles says you can be remarkable, not just satisfied and successful, cliching through life, remarkable. <laughs> Ten principles weave through each life area forming the fabric of human masterpiece. And then I give the ten principles. And then each of those life areas, you could apply each of those principles to. So that gives you, <coughs> that gives you ten for each one of those ten. Uh, intellect, emotion, body, connection, belief, precepts, function, <coughs> material, aesthetics, and your legacy. And the 10 principles, intentionality, integrity, humilitance. You don't even know what that word means. Matter of fact, well, I made that up. I also bought the URL for that, too, and I haven't put anything there. It's part that GoDaddy. Uh, curiosity, reason, integration, timing, fluidity, university libre placerism. Not even by the URL for that. I mean, don't think I'm going to need to. I don't think anyone's trying to steal that. Don't you do it. <laughs> And play. Okay? Um, yes, ma'am. Um, did you think that philosophy, or like every topic, or maybe every way you live your life, is that your philosophy? Yes. 100% yes. You are living by your philosophy. Who's your favorite philosopher? Me. Besides me. Besides me. And why? Jesus. Um, because when I clear the whole table of all the everything, I, I put Jesus there first, and I don't have a rational reason for doing it. I'm doing it out out of faith. I'm just taking that. Where do you start? I'm 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 assuming that the philosophy that you see developed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is probably the best portrayal. Of, of a philosophy to, to build the best human life on. And that's a faith issue for me, but I, but I admire his philosophy and try to measure mine against his philosophy more than, than anybody. Can man live without philosophy? Can man live without philosophy? Um, not with a mind, but yes, people are in vegetative states and People aren't usually philosophizing when they're um, just struggling to survive, like in an immediate emergency. You're just doing, sort of living from the, the, the basal ganglia and not the executive functions of your brain. If you're getting shot at, you're not getting too philosophical until you get hunkered down behind cover, and then you start philosophizing. Um, defining philosophy is an example of practicing philosophy, so that would be a false dichotomy. <laughs> had a special word for that kind of, oh, I love you, that's eros. Um, and agape is the kind of love that the Greeks imagined that perfect beings that are transcendent and beyond us, what they would have if they, if they benevolently loved us. Like when the New Testament says that God loves us. That's agape love. Uh, that is when 
the person loving has everything to benefit the object of that love with, but the, the object of that love, there's nothing they could possibly give back of any value that you, know, you, know, you can't, re, can't return. So it's giving without any hope of return because it's not even, it's not even plausible. So usually that means, not, there's a few exceptions in, in uh, Greek literature, but usually that means God's love or the God's love for, for mortals. Love and then you get Sophia right now. Or and Sophia, Sophia um, is wisdom, as, as we said. But that um, philos is the kind of love you might have um, you might have for your brother. If you're really loyal to your brother or a family member. You know, you, you expect them to do their bit. You're not going to do for them and do for them and do for them without taking them to task if they never do back. Or you, you, you hook them up when they need something and then they tell you, forget you. You know, then you're going to cut. That, they're going to get cut off eventually. There's a limit, but it's still a lot of loyalty involved, and um, and loyalty is a part of it. But it's something where you are you're still able to get something. Um, so it is a particular kind of love for Sophia, which is wisdom or prudence. Um, not the same thing as knowledge. It's not the same thing as information. Wisdom is like having good sense. Um, it's like Sophia also is, is thought of as the ability to handle your business, you know, to... Um, uh, to make good decisions that work out for you instead of being a fool. A fool would be someone who's not wise. Okay? So people who are lovers of wisdom, people who love it so much that they want to <coughs> they want to spend time dealing with it rather than just assuming it. They, you know, they for its own sake. Like it's the like it's the goal. Um and in a couple of places in Scripture, uh, in, in the uh, writings in the Old Testament, Jesus is sort of personified as wisdom. Wisdom goes back, it's like, it's talking about Jesus. Some of the even things we consider prophecies about Jesus are, are talking about uh, Jesus using the term wisdom like a nickname for him, like interchangeably. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Yes, sir. So as a theology major, I, I wonder sometimes if philosophy can hurt somebody's spiritual walk with God, or if it can help. Yes. Will you be covering some of the dangerous roads to take? Absolutely. Not, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And I will be, y you will be getting a bit of the flavor of my own philosophy as we go along. <coughs> I hope that the end product will be, even if you don't accept everything that, that I say, which would Ridiculous if you did. If anybody accepted everything I said, it doesn't make any sense. You, you got to take issue with some of it, or you're kind of a zombie. But you'll notice that I actually have experienced philosophy uh, and the tools that I get from philosophy to um, to make it so that my faith is is just beyond threat. Uh, I'll show you some things like what some philosophers have done. If we have time, I'll show you Anselm's ontological argument. That is something that if we do that, there's going to be four or five people here that have the slightest idea of what, by the end, what we're talking about. And if I was a student here, I wouldn't be smart enough. My brain wouldn't be enough horsepower under the hood to get it on the first time through. But there's just statistically, there's probably like three or four people here when we go through it that we go, oh yeah, wow. And those people, Anselm, St. Anselm, is ontological. Uh, or, there's more than one form of it, but there's one that's easiest that we sometimes get to. I'll also be um, showing you uh, Pascal's wager in a maybe a new way, and I'll also be developing for you the algebra of evil. That's my, that's my creation. We'll definitely get to the algebra of evil. Anselm.
and that's kind of a it's kind of a way of stating our position as Adventists in the great controversy, you know, mathematically. So that might be interesting. It builds my faith. And I will be demonstrating that the challenges, the intellectual challenges in our culture right now from arrogant, militant atheists, um, I'll show how the structure of their argument and of their philosophy is religious. And it isn't even respectable. I'll, I'll ask that we all use courtesy and be respectful about it, but we need to do it in a way like we would for somebody else's religion. But we need to call it what it is, and when people get arrogant and put their nose up and you're like, they, all, they got all this going on, you go, wait a minute, you don't even have that going on. But you say, you just try to use big words and if people diagrams, you go, you haven't said anything at all. And what you did said, say contradicted yourself. So without philosophy, I could not have seen that. I would be swept along with what started for me in third grade in Mrs. Walden's class, science class, the first time I was asked to consider where to become from. Not only reproduction, I mean uh, creation, evolution, cosmology, that sort of thing. And uh, telling us what a theory is and all of that. And so when I was eight, that started in, and um, you know, I was just tempted by authority. And, and she was saying what the, the, the smart people believe this way. Um, we believe in our culture found firmly that Charles Darwin gave us the evolutionary model. This first group of people, the pre-Socratics that we started talking about on Tuesday, we've had it since then. He did not. And almost everything I hear, people saying, well, Darwin showed us the internet. I would love to see how many of Darwin's books they have on their shelf because I've read what Darwin's written and I can't find the stuff they say most of the time. Actually, did he ever said it? It's become an archetype for them. It's become a symbol for their religion and they just put all kinds of stupidity into his mouth. But he didn't say it. Not only that, a lot of times he stated the obvious, uh, the opposite in obvious terms. That he obviously was against what a lot of people put on him. And you, you call him on it, and it's like, well, you know, if he'd been alive today, that's what he would have said. Get out. That's what I hear people doing with Jesus. Oh, if he'd been alive, he would agree with our doctrines, not yours. Get out. You, you just can't, can't live with that. Yes? So why has Darwin become the focal point of society? Because we needed a focal point. Because our society was losing its schema. And this is our prevailing myth right now. And by myth, that's not an insult. We have myths in the Judeo-Christian world. To say something has the, the, uh, the form of a myth, that it plays the part of a myth, does not mean it's not factual. It means what we do with it, what role it plays in our culture, in the schema that we all organize our thoughts around about reality and language and common activities. I want to point out something. Yes. That is, an, that is an excellent question. Is circular reasoning considered bad? We, we call it in the list of common fallacies, begging the question. Um, that depends. Because ultimately, it's actually all we have. It's really a matter of how small your circle is go back far enough, it's hard for people to see and call you on your silliness, and it's hard for you to see yourself. But I want to illustrate something that, that shows what people did when they kind of got the first foothold, at least in the Western world, to say, well, wait, maybe we could do this. Those pre-Socratics that sort of were like, <coughs> wait a minute, you know what we've been doing? Been doing superstitions. We've been believing things because that's what people believe the Roman than we are. 
And then they only believe that because that's what people said that were older than they were. And all that was, maybe, maybe, was someone trying to explain something they wanted to have power over. You know, there's a drought. What are we going to do about it? Well, people have noticed that you do certain things and you get certain results. If you're freezing and you light a fire, that takes care of it. So now it's dry and you're going, um, shoot. Well, let's try to find something. And they start dancing and shaking some beads on some string and banging on a drum and painting a certain <coughs> way and lean this way and have a certain, okay, well, maybe you're dancing wrong. You dance another way. And at range, you go, wait, what were you just doing? Someone write that down. I can't. We don't write it yet. Darn it. Don't forget. Dance with me. You had a good memory and you danced better. Come on, do it again. It's still raining. Whoa. <coughs> and that becomes a belief that it has effects. And you start saying, there's got to be someone up there with a watering can or a hose or something. They, 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 or, they're, or they're crying or something. But let's do something that makes them cry again because we need the water. There's no creek. We don't have a spring. We're dying. Lost my child. It gets real serious. And then you get, when it gets real serious and then someone makes fun of it, you go, don't do that. You're going to make watering can guy really mad. So don't do that. You're going to take more of my children. So you go away and if you're going to do that. You go, you go water and can guy over here. And then it gets like, no, forget you, and they get sacrilegious, and you go, I can't, I can't afford this. It's either you or my kid, you're dead. And they get real serious like that, and then, then centuries go by. And it changes, and it gets, and then people find out that if they can say the most plausible thing, that people will pay them when they don't even have to work. You know, they're better at leading the dance, and pretty soon other people have to do dangerous and sweaty things to get their share of the hunt or the harvest, but not the priest. So, you know, you got this whole thing taken off. But then somebody noticed something. And I got to, I mean, I got to apologize. We're just going to just take a philosophy. It's, not, it's hardly going to be a, you should help me. You want me to come up? Uh, in a minute. You're going to help me, though, I think. I'll, I'll pay you. I'm going to hire you. Um, <laughs> it's so off the subject. Any, any of you, uh, if you've taken my classes and you know this, don't, don't, don't give it away. Let people have the experience um, like you did. Um, how many of you know about playing cards? You know, you go on a casino and play, you know, yeah. blackjack or whatever. You know, you know about cards. 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 Um, Somebody that knows about cards, look at my chalk chuck here. Somebody that knows about cards, uh, tell me uh, what are the four suits in a deck of cards? Diamond, hearts, clubs, spades, clubs, spades. Who said that? He said it first. Go pick it. I think you said diamonds, hearts. This always gets bad because I can't draw. <laughs> Heinous. <laughs> what did I forget? Oh, well, that one I usually do a worse job. Oh well, it's crooked. Uh, you ready to paint some folk? Okay, get your stash. I'll give you. You'll give you that, and I'll take this. I'll take some from your stash. Somebody just toss out off the top of your head just two of those suits. Just no top. Hearts. What? No, not cards, just suits. Oh. Hearts and diamonds. Hearts and diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Hearts and diamonds. Okay? So we'll get rid of clubs and spades. Um, somebody else just pick one of those suits. Hearts, just, diamonds. Did you say hearts? Okay. Okay, that hearts, that leaves diamonds. So diamonds, now in, in the cards, in each suit, there's a two, three, four, five, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, king, queen, ace. <clears throat> okay, somebody just just yeah. toss toss off, see five of those cards. Just name <laughs> 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 Two, three, four, five, <laughs> six. Okay, that leaves seven through eight. Then. Okay. Uh, somebody just give me two of those. Queen, Queen, and, nine. Nine. Queen and nine. Queen and nine. Okay, somebody give me three of those. <laughs> Seven, eight, ten. So seven, eight, and ten, that leaves Jack's ten. Queen, ace. Can I get somebody just pick one ace? Ace. Ace. Ace of what suit? Diamonds. Ace of diamonds. Um, now that's where I need you. We're going to not do philosophy. You might as well come help us and not do philosophy. Come on up. I'm going to say sorry to the owner of the iPhone. I'm going to put it over here. It's still running and everything. Um, is that the, that card? No. No. Okay. So we're going to put that down. We're going to put this on top. Is that your card? No. We're going to put that down. Put that on top. Is that your card? No. Put that down. Put that on top. Is that your card? Put that down, put that on top. Is that your card? Yeah. Put that down, put that on top. Find it. Right in there, find it. Do you want to go through it? No, just, just look and find your card in there. Give it to one of them. Have them look through. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. It's serious business. Hard to say it's philosophy though. True. Well, well, I don't want that to happen today. So, no. so don't kill me. It'll be bad. You good? Okay. So make a fist. Just like this. Magic is philosophy. He's the fastest class you're going to be a magician. Okay, somebody give me two suits. King, 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 Okay, let's do this part again. Hey, can we raise our hands? I don't want to yell. Just doing math instead of cards. Just stand up when you say it. No, I don't Okay, know. somebody just give me a hand. Move your hand. You. Uh, just list, say, six cards. Seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen. Seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen. One more. One more. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 two, two, two. 
<laughs> okay. And leaves three, four, five, six, king and ace. Okay? Uh, somebody just, you. I look over here, bro. Yeah, give me two bucks. <laughs> three and four. Two, okay. You gotta switch your seat, bro. I know, I'm about to. Oh. I'm about to you know. Yes? King and six. I need someone to just six. toss up. <laughs> Who said that? Me. You? Okay. <laughs> six. Six of what suit? Who would you gonna come up? Okay. Aww. Excellent. <laughs> Dang, looking over here. All right. You got class, man. Okay. Is that it? No, sir. That's not it? Okay. So put that down and we'll put this one on top. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, let's do that again. Is that it? No. Okay. So we'll put that down. I'll put that on top. Is that it? There. I know how to do a trick now, dude. Is that it? <laughs> he missed that. Is that it? It's philosophy. Is that it? Is it there? <laughs> True. Can you look in that pot too? We will. We will in just a second. All right. Make a fist. But I don't get yes. how, how he slapped it and now I stay. So, <laughs> people who haven't already had my classes, because I usually do, I mean, except I didn't do it in Christian spirituality, but uh, my other classes where you've seen this before. How, honestly, how do we do that? I don't know. Magic. <laughs> yeah, magic. Oh, wait. Okay, never mind. I never mind. You already. So, so for, for the number, it's a forced pick. Um, yes. So, when people give you cards, sometimes you cross them off and sometimes you keep them depending on what you want to stay there. Why would I want to say that? Oh. Um, because you know which card's on the bottom and you're using that to control what cards they I showed there. you what was on the bottom. No, but I knew where we were going, right? Yeah. I knew before we started what the card was going to be. But I tried to create the impression that you were kind of leading it and you were in control of it and that it was could have been anything. But I knew where we were going to end up from the start. No, because I was doing non-philosophical, non-philosophical thought. If I was doing philosophical thought, I would have been willing to simply say, I don't care where we end up. I just want to end up there honestly. When you take somebody and you know what you want to discover, and then you make them feel like they've explored with you, and oh, look what we found. That's like when you write your paper completely, and then you go ask the person at the reference desk at the library to help you find your sources. <laughs> Now, my best friend is one of those librarians over there, and I don't think he has a quarter go by where people don't do that, like lots of people, all the time. Hey, look, I wrote this paper. I need some sources for this. That's not scholarship. That's not an exploration. If you know what data you're looking for, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to show that the product is efficacious and safe, you hire researchers, you make them sign a non-disclosure form, so they're not allowed to say anything to anybody about what they found doing their research, conducting the study. So they conduct a study, 
and they turn it in and walk away. Their name is on it, though, with you know three PhDs and head of a major uh, biochemistry department in a university or whatever. They turn it in, they get their $100,000, and then the drug company looks at it and says, yeah, that doesn't look like what we were hoping. It goes in the file drawer or the shredder. Then they hire another researcher and say, okay, well maybe 500 people was too many. Let's do 50. And then that person conducts a study with 50 people and then none of those bad things show up. And some people kind of in that study think they might have gotten better. Okay, we'll publish that one. And they do 15 studies and take two of them and shred the others. And that's all the information the public gets. And I'm not making that up. That is how drug research is done today. All, all over America and all over Europe. And it's legal and it's dishonest. And when you know you're gonna be the one taking the drug and then you find out later that they did that and that drug hurt you, cost you your liver, and now you're dying you're on a transplant list. Too bad. They didn't break the law, they're not liable. If you reason that way when you're trying to find out about reality, you end up with crap instead of any hope for truth. When you start already convinced of what is real and what is true and what is the good thing, and then you start going and looking for evidence. Have you ever done a Bible study that way? You know what you want to say. Now go to the concordance and find some passage you're reading and go, oh, that doesn't say that. You look for another one that talks about that topic and you, oh, okay. Skip that. That doesn't give you an honest look at what was actually inspired as the real message in the Bible, does it? It doesn't give people that you're preaching to an honest look at what would be found if somebody who didn't know anything about religion in the Bible didn't care, and they take it and they go, well, what's it say? Well, it does say that. Oh, and look, it says this too. Say, huh, I don't know how to fit those things together. Well, that's right. Hold that on it and, and just keep going all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And then you say, well, what does it say about that? And they say, it says a lot of things. Well, you know, what's the gist of it? Well, there isn't a gist. This person said this. You know, and then in another book, another person said the opposite. And then over here, you got someone saying, and you go, huh, so that's not really conclusive, is it? No, it's not. You go, all right. That's a different way to explore. That's a different way. If, if you're having an Easter egg hunt, and there's 30 people, and you hid the eggs, you shouldn't be able to compete with them. That's not fair. You would think that was cheating. If the people who owned the farm where they were having the thing, and you're a little kid, and they have little kids, and their little kids help them hide it, and then when it's time to go look, they got a basket full of eggs, and you got grass stains, <laughs> and nothing else. These people had an idea that they would clear off everything from the table completely. They'd erase the board and start over. And then they said, what did we know actually that somebody didn't tell us that we should take in their word for it? And they had to admit, nothing. Nothing. Even our notion of common sense, that varies if you just go to another country and, and see what's common sense there. Now there's some things that people do agree with. Um, gravity is a little hard to argue with. But the explanation for, why, for how it works, if right now you've never heard of 
of Newton, Galileo, Einstein, or any of the scientists or natural philosophers in the Western tradition, if somebody asked you to explain why the thing goes down, what, what, what the heck would you say? It would be intractable. You could make up crap. You could make a cool story about it. You could say, well, because God wanted it down there. And it was up here. Whenever we push things out and there's nothing under it, God really wants it down there, so he sends an angel invisible, and they shove it down there as fast as it, they can. And then after a few generations, you'd, you'd find people who are, and I'm not kidding, I mean they will kill you if you disagree with that explanation. And they had. And they'll do it today. We're not past that. There's people who find that delicious to kill people because they disagree with their religious ideas. They want them dead. Because they disagree about God in their heart of hearts, they get a good feeling when they hear how many of the enemy got blown up with a drone. You think that doesn't happen? We're gonna be strong. People don't accept our way. They can just die. They just don't need to have a country. They don't even need, they don't even need dry land. Philosophy means you're willing, you're secure enough in the things you think now are true to take them off the table and start from zero with an honest mind and say, is this what I would come up with if I had no if I had never heard those things that I know, would I look with an honest mind at, the, at, at whatever evidence I can gather and whatever thoughts I can have and come up with what I believe? Because if you wouldn't, if you'd have to say, not in a million years, then what's the matter with you? That means that you don't actually believe that you make any sense. You believe that you believe something that couldn't stand up to an honest inquiry. Your faith is then so brittle, you are one bad mood, mad at God day from checking your faith. You do not have a safe, secure, religious faith. If in your heart of hearts you go, I better not do that because I know it isn't going to end up put back together anything like I got it now if I take it apart. I'll never get it back together. If I start messing with it, la 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 la, I can't know these things. So that is not, what I'm saying is definitely not a religious point of view. The interesting thing is, you will find... That if you take the tools of philosophy and you look at everybody's philosophy, at everybody's schema, the scaffolding, the, 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 the foundation and, the, and the, the steel girders that they hang all the other stuff on and pound the nails into once their studs bolted to it and all of that, your whole kind of basis for even considering reality we have to admit that no matter which one you pick, at some point you have had to say, I, I actually don't know that for sure. I'm going to have to just start with something or else I'm going to have nothing. And just saying I got nothing, who was it that was sitting back here? It was one of you that's still back there. Which one of you on Tuesday said, well, if that's true, if we're all just in a dream or we're just a video game, then we'll, what should we even do? Who said that? That was you. That was excellent. And I said, oh, we got a serious philosopher, the second one. Who's the guy that was sitting back there that was the first one? Where'd you go? He was already too developed. He dropped the course. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. It was a plan from somebody who knows anything at all. And they said, no, it's not a good place. In fact, those early philosophers they had some real basic questions and then long answers and arguments and, and for centuries about them. However, the basic questions 
sort of when they make lists of, well, what are the basic questions? There's some things that overlap from one person or philosopher to the next. One of the things they ask is, what we were talking about Tuesday, what's, what's reality even? What is reality? How can you even ask what's real? Well, I don't even know what it means to be real. I don't even know what is means. That's ontology. I don't know what is is. Who here is taking Greek, you theotypes? None? Not yet. Amy? I am. Uh, Atai. A A Atai. Oh, it's a Oh, You haven't gotten to that form. Oh, Atai. Atai. A E A Atai. Oh, it's a S A Oh, Atai. Right? No? Yeah. Okay. Just these errors. Okay. Um, it's a it's a an incomplete being. Uh, a E A on A E A Atai. B A I. That A M E. I am, uh, and, and, and by the way, we've put a lot of importance on those passages where, where God and Jesus said, I am, the other the existence thing. We'll talk, we'll talk real specifically about the, about the exegesis of those passages later because of that, and I think of it. But in asking what there is, that question you have follows from that. Because when you say, well, what is and what is real, then what, I, what am I supposed to do? What should, what's a good thing to do and what's, I mean, do I just sit here and just wait to rot? Or do I say, oh, well, if that's true, then I should behave accordingly. Um, if that's not true, I shouldn't support it. I shouldn't go act like it is because then I'm stupid and I'm doing something that's meaningless, right? And so, what is there? What should I do? Um, people have also asked, how did this all get started? Or did it all get started? Is it a circle? Or is it a line? Do things go in order? Do they always go in order? What do you think? Do you think things just go in order on a timeline? It's just... Hey, it was 8 o'clock and then it was 10 o'clock. You did this, and then later on you did this, and then later on you did this. It doesn't matter who's watching. It, it, it happened in the order it happened, right? Reality and time and everything. Time is, it goes one way. And it doesn't circle back. Is that true? Yeah. Right, except that it's not. It's not actually true. And it can be demonstrated in laboratory that it's not true. It violates what, what Newton said, uh, excuse me, it violates what Einstein said, it's exactly what Newton said, it violates what, violates what, uh, what uh, he said. In fact, what order things occurred in, in, in time actually depends on where the person is that you're asking that question to. For real. You can place somebody in the universe. There it is. You can place somebody in the universe, say, here. You can place somebody else here at B. And you can place somebody else here at C. And then you can say, um, often, often a distance, a good distance, you know, dotted line, um, you have event. Um, alpha and event beta that occur. So this person is watching and says A happened and then B happened. And in their frame of reference, it's not just, oh, that's when the light reached them. It's not like that. It's not like, well, that's when I found out about it. It's not like, well, that's how I, pre no, for real, mathematically. In reality, for this person, alpha happened, and then some time went by, and then B happened later. And then this person, these events were absolutely simultaneous. They happened at exactly the same instant in the reality of this person. And in this person's reality, 
B, or beta, happened as an event. And then some time went by, and then A happened. That is a fact. It's not a silly nursery rhyme. It's not a religious parable. That's real. Time is not just an inviolable sequence of events. It doesn't actually, in the real world, work that way, and it can be shown not to. Is there any way you can give an example of what that looks like? Because you said it wasn't, it wasn't like, you said something about, it wasn't because like the light hit him then, but it does seem like it. It seems like it's a perspective. Because it is a perspective. Oh. Here's the issue with relativity. There's nowhere you can stand in the universe that's the sacred place to stand so that that's, what it's, that's the factual place. And in that frame of reference, it's real, and then others are not are real or they're less real. Everywhere you can be is just as valid and just as authoritative for being a frame of reference on reality. And that was a big shock when Einstein said that. And it violated what Newton had said. It certainly violated what the pre-philosophical people believed. There is no authoritative spot where you can be that that's right and somebody else is wrong from their perspective in physics. Yes. Do you remember when we drew those number lines on the board on Tuesday? Oh, you weren't there. I'm sorry. Um, well, what I did was I drew this. We called this X. And I drew this. We called this Y. And then we pretend that there's one that comes straight out. Okay, it's a 90 degree angle everywhere to the plane of the chalkboard. Um, but I, ha I can't draw that way because I'm not allowed to make holes in the board and have lines go through the other classroom. So I have to pretend that it actually sticks straight out towards you. Okay, like if I put a stick there and there was a, the back of it going into the other room. So that one is Z. And then just like these are dimensions, like a place, like how to measure something um, to the degree that this is like this and this is like this. There's one we can't draw, but we give it T. We're out of alphabet letters. We give it T, and it's the fourth dimension. And it is a dimension like the other dimensions. You can move back and forth in it, and it, it, it's kind of like a place, and it's called time. Now. If that's true, that there are four dimensions, 4D, if God is in every way infinite, if there is a quantity that you could describe our reality with, like we have to be stuck in these four dimensions usually, if the number for us is four, and if the number for chalkboard guy that holds still, Flatland guy is up and down, left and right. He never even moves, so he's just got two. What number goes with the infinite God? Five? Is that infinite? What? Is that infinite? But no, I said our actual nature that we're living in. In order to make it make sense, so we don't get horse manure when we put the math together with what we're actually measuring, we can't do that yet with less than 9, 10, or 11. That's debatable. I mean, that's just our reality. We can see we need that many actual dimensions. We can't think about what they would look like or how they'd be, because we're chalkboard guy to those. <coughs> Yeah. But then yesterday and right now when you're explaining like time, like there's a specific time that you could stop and then like you could see this thing happen. Like is that not the same for everyone? It's 
It's not the same for everyone, no. Mm -hmm. It depends on where you are. So does length. Do you know that the length of a stick or a metal rod or whatever depends on how fast <coughs> it's going in relation to the one measuring it? That's kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? But it's true. Here's what happens, though. The difference that is made is so very small that in as close together as we always are, almost always, because we can actually measure things like, I don't know if you know this, but this is a real experiment. You take a clock, and you set the clock, synchronize with another clock, and you have two 747s fly. They're not even supersonic. They're 600 miles an hour. They circumnavigate the globe at the equator and then come back to where they started. But they went different directions. Those clocks don't match. <coughs> Okay, so for your example, for ex going back to the example of the when you did alpha and beta, uh -huh. and how it changed for each 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 number. Yes, the distance that people were apart and from the event would have to be so great that we don't. It's it, it would never end up making something before that you saw after, you know, like in your frame. We share a reference frame on Earth for the most part. If we're having, if we both witness something, in other words it's going to be in the same order because it's such a small difference when the distances are so close and our speed relative to each other is so similar. It would have to be big parsec light years <coughs> kind of distances to, to show that that's what's actually happening. It rounds to being pretty close to the same here. So then my question would be, what? so then what, like, like in that scenario, what, what happened first? Like, one person would say alpha, then beta. Right. Uh, another one would say beta, then alpha. The reason I ask is, what's truth? Like, is there, is there no absolute truth then? Because Where is God? Where, if, we, if we have this kind of a, of a system where we can measure how, from this little dot or from the tip of my nose or from the chalk, we go in meters or miles or whatever. We go this much X, this much Y, and this much Z at this time. What address would you give God on that? Where is God? He's, he's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's isn't he? everywhere. So every address, right? So the same entity is everywhere all at once. Certainly God is far enough apart from God so that those things actually do depend on perspective. The, the, the distances and the velocities and everything are, are adequate. So that with God, we can have a statement like, you know what, with me, a day, a thousand years, they're the same. It is, that kind of thing doesn't apply to me. When Moses was at the burning bush and was told to put off his shoes from his feet because he was standing on the holy ground. Remember that whole bit? Some of you have heard that story. He said, go talk to the Pharaoh and say it's time to let... Uh, to let the nation of, uh, of Israel, let the Hebrews go. And uh, Moses negotiated that a little bit, and then he said, um, well, what's your name? Uh, Pharaoh's going to ask, what's your name? Because Pharaoh had lots of gods. You know, there was God of the frogs, and God of the river, and God of the flies, and, and God of books, and God of, of men, and God of women, and God of fertility, and God of this, and Pharaoh was a god, and everybody's a god. There's like a whole Facebook of God. You know, what's your Facebook name? I'll catch you on LinkedIn or whatever. So what's your handle there, God? Um, you know, your Skype handle, so he'll know how to talk to you and say, hey, forget you. And God, like, you don't put a name up on me and say, how do I, with, you know, I'll look you up. I, and then it says, you tell him I am sent you. In the Hebrew, it's not just I am. It's a, it's a funny little mix of don't go together form that if you would really translate it honestly, it would be more closely rendered to say, look, I am the always having been will be. You're asking for my name and my Skype handle. I'm existence itself. Don't ask my name. Just tell him existence sent you. Reality sent you. 
being forever in the future and in the past the always having been will being sent you you can't let those people go so when when mixing those forms like that it's demonstrating and saying things like before abraham was i am not i was right that means right now i'm existing before abraham was he was talking to people that thought Abraham was a great big deal. Reference all of history by when Abraham, because that's when their people came about. Nationalistic, bigoted people. Abraham's my father. You know, you're nothing. You're a Gentile because you're the wrong ethnic. He said, look, look, look. Tell me about Abraham. At this moment, I'm existing before Abraham. That's hard for us to understand. Infinite God would be of infinite dimensionality. Because if you said, but there's only 11 dimensions, then God could say, and now there's 12. Now, now there's 12. And he says, oh, not so fast. Now there's 50. That's what it is to be omnipotent. And if God isn't like that, then our definition of God is ridiculous falls apart. It ain't real. If God isn't beyond it all like that, if he's just, hey, I got one more dimension than you, or I'm stronger, I'm faster, I, I don't kiss up to the strongest bully on the block. I'm going to worship somebody just because they have a bigger bank account or bigger biceps or they have a car that goes faster than mine or they've got authority or something. Forget that. If God isn't utterly other than, then God doesn't deserve my worshiper, I'm a sucker. I'm, I mean, what is this? Worship from a creature or Stockholm Syndrome? I assert that God, if God is real, is of infinite dimensionality, that all times are always existing for that entity. They're not something that goes away and that's gone in the past. It's still real. That's why when we say Jesus died infinitely on the cross, dying that second death, an infinite death, that's because there never was a time, there never could be a time, where God isn't currently, in God's currentness, being crucified. God inhabiting all of time and all of space at all times, if it ever happened, it will always, having been, will happen to him. That isn't a way we could experience it. When we get dead, we can just get dead and be done with ourselves. Right? But when you get dead at a point, and you exist at once at all points, when you get dead, if you ever did get dead, you're always getting dead. It doesn't ever go away for the infinite. And it's so merciful that you and I don't have that burden. Absolutely, that there is no past, there is no present, there is no future. It's just where am I going to manifest? And probably is manifesting everywhere all at once anyway. Is always there, dwelling in every time at all times. And I can make a strong case for it. if that isn't true, then what are you worshiping? You guys will worship a cow or something. They've got more stomachs than you do. Oh, cow. Kind of what the Israelites did when Moses was up trying to figure out what the law was going to be. Came down and they were worshiping a fake uh, statue and silly nonsense. And when we make God to be just a human being, we're just as stupid. It's an idol. We make an idol. It's such a wonderful coincidence that whenever I create God in my image, you know, God in, in the beginning, God created man in his own image, and man has been returning the favor ever since. But when I create God in my image, it's a funny coincidence. He hates the same stuff and the same people that I do. And he rejoices when they get what's coming to them. He and I, we share a special schadenfreude. You know what schadenfreude is, right? Who's my German student? German student. Schadenfreude? It's a German word that we don't have a word for in English. Go ahead. 
Well, I'm going to teach you a German word. Schadenfreude. It's a German word that there is no English word that you can translate. You have to explain the concept. Because we don't actually have the concept. We probably deny the concept in, in English. It means, it means, when I see you getting goofed up, you're suffering, I'm into that. I take a special, unique kind of, yeah, baby, I love watching that. It's like, oh, oh, oh so-and-so's getting a whipping. <laughs> you know that thing? Like, when you go, you go tattle, and then you listen. <laughs> when you get respect, you yeah, oh, yeah. That's shot him. When we love to watch stupid criminal tricks, you know? That little Japanese girl in the elevator on YouTube that goes around on Facebook, she's probably like fourth grade or third grade, and she's got her little backpack there, little anime on the backpack, and she's just standing there. Little girl. And some big man comes in there, and the door closes, and then he, and he goes to grab her and assault her. And then he gets to go to school that day because she has been a lifelong martial arts student. In fact, she's a martial arts expert. And that elevator video captures him getting thrashed. And it's better than chocolate chip cookies. It's, it's wonderful to watch him get it. You know? The, uh, the man that broke into the home where there was like a 71-year-old woman living there alone with her mom. With her mom. And her mom is in her 90s. And some sick reprobate breaks in, rapes the old lady first, then rapes the less old lady, then rapes the old lady again, then when he starts raping the less old lady the second time, the 90-something lady takes the fireplace poker and makes so many pieces of him, they can't tell which part was which. And we go, God was coming to him, that's where I wanted it to end. And we go, yeah, we're on the beat. When they don't realize that the little old lady in the wheelchair has a 357 Magnum under her Afghan that she's knitting, and she's actually motoring her way. This is a real story, I am not kidding you. In New York City. Oh, but the old lady has a concealed weapons permit. She was a competition handgun athlete all of her life. So she still has her cannon. She's in her electric wheelchair to go to the range. She's on her way to the range. And somebody decides that he's going to assault her. And he fails. <laughs> Predictably, he fails because she pretty much empties all six, uh, all six rounds in, into Mugger Dude. And we watch that stuff and go, oh, yeah. You do ever watch stupid human tricks where people get crocked and try to do skateboard off the second floor roof and stuff? Ever watch that stuff? Shot in three. You like it? Now, does God take the same pleasure when somebody gets what's coming to them that we, that we do? If you try to say he doesn't and that we shouldn't, you're doing heresy in most people's church. God does. God hates the same people that he does. People that I hate the people that you hate, Lord. I wonder what which he knew first, whether he knew that God hated him, so he said, Oh God hates him, I should hate him. Or is there any possibility? He hated him and then he said, Check it out, God does it too. I will see you on Tuesday. Bless